there. This is part two of the 2.09 lesson. We were in the midst of the reading, so we'll continue with that here on page 639. Let's look at the picture first. This is Armistice Day. Americans celebrate the end of World War I, November 11th, 1918. And number that's when the peace treaty was signed, November 11th. That's when we celebrate Veterans Day, the 11th month. At the 11th hour, um, it was all signed, uh, November 11th. Okay, so let's read about the war's end and consequences. By the fall of 1918, 2 million American troops were in Europe. Their presence broke the stalemate on the Western Front, enabling the combined armies of the Allies to drive the Germans out of France. America, said one German commander, became the decisive power in the war. Meanwhile, years of war and embargo had left the German people weary, impoverished, and hungry. Facing the prospect of revolution, the Kaiser stepped down and the new German government called for a truce. On November 11, 1918, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the guns along the Western Front finally fell silent. The war had exacted a terrible toll on the combatant nations. Approximately 2 million Germans lost their lives, as did 1.5 million men from Aust Austria-Hungary, 1 million from the British Empire, 1.7 million from France, and 1.7 million from Russia. Because of the late entry of the United States into the war, casualties among Americans were comparatively light. Nevertheless, more than 50,000 American soldiers died in combat, more than would be killed decades later in the Vietnam War. Wilson's 14 points. Okay, this is important here. But before that, let's read about the influenza epidemic. While World War I claimed many lives as the war neared its end, a disease killed far more people than died in the war. Indeed, it killed more people than any other illness in recorded history. At least 50 million, some estimates say up to 100 million people lost their lives in an epidemic of influenza that swept the world from the fall of 1918 into 1919. In general, influenza most severely affects children and the elderly, but this strain proved deadliest for young adults. Estimates of deaths in the United States alone ranged from 500,000 to 675,000. In Europe, about as many American soldiers died of influenza as died in combat. And this is, this was important because uh, you really have people moving around the world. And so the contact was much greater. So that's why it became a worldwide epidemic, which is the same thing we fear today when we have things like Ebola. It's the, the world is much more fluid. People move around much more, and these diseases spread uh, much more quickly than they did before when people didn't have as much contact. Okay, Wilson's 14 points. Okay, now his 14 points here, these are important to remember. This really... Um, sets the stage for things to come on the world scene and what Wilson was really trying to set for world peace, his 14 points. Two months after the truce, representatives of the Allied Nations met at the old royal palace in Versailles, France. That's pronounced Versailles. With the purpose of negotiating a lasting peace, no representatives of the defeated Central Powers were invited to help shape the terms of the peace. Notice that. Mistake number one. They did not invite the losers to come up with the terms of peace. That was a big mistake, as they will learn when World War II starts years later. Many mistakes here, but they, were, they didn't realize at the time. Let's look at these pictures here, the caption. David Lloyd George of Britain... Vittorio Orlando of Italy, George Clemenceau of France, and Woodrow Wilson of the United States helped craft the Treaty of Versailles. No representatives of the Central Power were invited. So, of course, you have the winners setting the terms for the losers, which is not always the best idea. Some of the Allied leaders, especially French Prime Minister George Clemenceau, blamed Germany for starting the war and wanted to punish the Germans severely. But Woodrow Wilson, the head of the American delegation, proposed far more generous terms of peace. In January 1918, even before the war's end, President Wilson stood before Congress and set forth his idealistic program for a post-war world. Wilson's plan for peace, known as the 14 Points, called for justice, not revenge. He wanted the victors of the Great War to be generous towards defeated countries in order to prevent the bitterness that might provoke future wars. Key point here. Under the 14 points, Wilson stressed self-determination. That means people being able to um, rule themselves. He said the people of Poland, Romania, Serbia, Hung Turkey, and many other lands should determine their own fate. Wilson hoped that self-determination would end the old imperialist system in which powerful industrial nations grabbed and ruled overseas colonies. 
The 14 points also included principles to help avoid tensions between nations. Wilson called for an end to secret treaties between countries. He urged freedom of the seas and removal of barriers to trade. He called for nations to reduce their stockpiles of arms and weapons. Because that's just going to make you nervous, right? If your neighbor's got a lot of weapons, you're going to want to have a lot of weapons too because you don't know what they got planned. Finally, he proposed creating a new organization, a general association of all nations, to help keep peace. Wilson hoped that in his League of Nations, members could solve their differences by way of discussions and votes rather than through armed conflict. The Treaty of Versailles. Wilson believed that all the great war's widespread destruction, something good could something good could oh we'll come back to this 14 points. Something good could come, a lasting peace and the spread of freedom. Such high ideals would not be welcomed by embittered Europeans. Prime Minister Clemenceau of France reportedly sneered, God gave us the Ten Commandments and we broke them. Wilson gave us the 14 points. We shall see. In the end, the Treaty of Versailles incorporated most of Clemenceau's demands. It stripped Germany of its overseas colonies. Okay, now this is important. All these things that they're um, blaming and taking away from uh, Germany so is going to be important to note for years down the road in World War II. It stripped Germany of its overseas colonies. It incorporated a war guilt clause blaming Germany alone for starting the conflict. Finally, it required that Germany pay the Allies reparations, huge financial payments to cover the cost of the war. Despite these punitive measures, the treaty earned Wilson's approval because it called for respecting the rights of small nations and provided for the establishment of a cherished League of Nations. Back home in America, Wilson urged the Senate to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. In an impassioned speech, she declared that the League of Nations was the only hope of mankind. Dare we reject it and break the heart of the world? But some prominent Americans attacked the treaty as an infringement on American sovereignty. Referring to Wilson, former President Theodore Roosevelt said he distrusted a man who loves other countries as much as his own. Senators in Roosevelt's Republican Party saw opposition to the treaty as a potent issue to use against Wilson, a Democrat. So basically, the League of Nations would be a group of countries. It's similar to our modern-day United Nations, if you know, if you've heard of the UN before. A group of countries that would work together to maintain peace. And some people were afraid that would not make the United States powerful enough, or not really powerful enough, but would not the United States would not be able to make their own decisions because they would have to follow through with what other countries were suggesting. And that's why some were talking about some. Americans were attacking it, did not want to ratify the, the League of Nations with the Treaty of Versailles in there. Excuse me, I said that backwards. Did not want to ratify the Treaty of Versailles with the League of Nations in there. With the treaty stalled in the Senate, Wilson took his case to the people, embarking on a grueling cross-country speaking tour by train, giving as many as four speeches a day. The strain of the schedule brought on a stroke, which left... The president partially paralyzed. He remained incapac incapacitated until his death in 1924. Meanwhile, the Versailles Treaty had gone down to defeat in the Senate. The United States never joined the League of Nations. So there was a League of Nations, but the United States was never part of it. And it was only a temporary association. Um, it would later, like I said, after World War II, um, the United Nations would be developed in a different scope of what the League of Nations did. But... Um, the same purpose, but a different scope in how they handled affairs. Consequences of the Versailles Treaty. This is important. This is all important, but this is really important for how it's going to shape the future. The end of World War I saw the creation of a number of new nations, most notably in Central Europe, where Aust the Austro-Hungary, Austro Hungarian Empire fragmented into the states of Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. But the rise of small nations did not result in the peaceful cooperation Wilson had hoped for. Instead, it led to a surge in nationalist feeling and antagonism between peoples. Nowhere was the spirit of militant nationalism stronger than in Germany. Humiliated and embittered by what they viewed as the unjust terms of the Treaty of Versailles, many Germans longed for revenge against their former enemies. Former corporal Adolf Hitler ranted, It cannot be that two million Germans should have fallen in vain. No, we do not pardon. We demand vengeance. In the 1930s, Hitler's Nazi party would rise to power on a tide of German resentment. Thus, the First World War helped pave the way for the Second World War. 
A return to isolationism. Compared to the nations of Europe with their depleted populations, devastated landscapes, and wrecked economies, the United States suffered relatively little from World War I. Wartime trade fed American economic prosperity, a prosperity that would continue through the roaring 1920s. Despite this economic prosperity, the war left many Americans disillusioned. Continued conflict in Europe and the failure of the League of Nations to keep the peace left many Americans disappointed by the aftermath of the war to make the world safe for democracy. In the United States, Warren Harding, a Republican, won election to the presidency in 1920 pr promising a return to normalcy after the turmoil of the war years. Most Americans wanted to turn aside from Europe's continuing troubles and the un country entered a new period of isolationism. Okay, let's read this little excerpt here about Edith Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's wife. Following her husband's stroke, Edith Wilson, the president's wife, stepped in to help run the government. The first lady acted as the ailing president's liaison with the leaders of Congress and the cabinet. She resisted efforts to transfer power to Vice President Thomas Marshall. Her actions led some to label her, her the secret president. In later years, Congress amended the Constitution to provide for a more orderly transfer of authority to the vice president when the president is, in the words of the amendment, unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. So we, for a time, we almost did have a woman president. Okay, military casualties, looking at this graph. As you can see, Russia was hard, hard hit. Um, Germany hard hit, France, Austria, Hungary, the British Empire, Italy, Turkey, United States, relatively small. And Belgium also relatively small, even though much of the fighting took place in Belgium. And then let's look at Wilson's 14 points. In his 14 points, President Woodrow Wilson laid out his idealistic plan for lasting peace in a post-war world. And let's read the definition. A covenant is a formal and binding agreement between two or more parties, a promise. So the 14 points are, number one, open covenants of peace. No private international understandings of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. So no secret meetings. Number two, absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas, alike in peace and war. So should not worry about getting attacked. The seas are neutral territory. Three, the removal so far as possible of economic barriers and the establishment of an equality of trade conditions among nations. So fair trade, free trade, no trade barriers. Four, adequate guarantees given and taken that national armaments will be reduced to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. Reducing your weaponry. Five, a free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims. Fixing your overseas, your colonial, your imperialistic territories. Um, adjust those, not to have so many overseas territories. The evacuation, number six, the evacuation of all Russian territory and a sincere welcome into the society of free nations under institutions of our own choosing. So that deals with the Russian Revolution and the changing society in Russia. Number seven, Belgium must be evacuated and restored without any attempt to limit the sovereignty which she enjoys in common with all other free nations. Like I said, Belgium was hard hit during the war, and they wanted to evacuate that from occupation and make it um, help fix it up. Number nine, no, number eight, all French territory should be freed and the invaded portions restored. Number nine, a readjustment of the frontiers of Italy should be effected among clearly recognizable land, lines, lines of nationality. 10, the people of Austria-Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and assured should be accorded the freest opportunity of autonomous development, which means um, the certain nationalities should have their lines drawn among where they are so they can be self-governing, not just grouped in this large empire. Number 11, Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro should be evacuated, occupied territories restored. 11, no, excuse me, 12 nationalities which are now under Turkish rule should be assured in undoubtedly security of life and absolutely unmolested opportunity of autonomous development. 13, an independent Polish state should be erected which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations. And 14, so all of the, several of these last points were all about self-governing nations, um, not to be taken over by a large empire. And the last one, the 14th point, talks about the League of Nations. A general association of nations must be formed for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. Okay, I do want to go back and finish the online activity. So we'll do that in the third part of the video, and we'll stop here. So part three will be coming up soon. To be continued.